Hey guys, in this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you the untold story of Delray Watch, how myself, as well as my business partner in Delray Watch, how we grew, scaled, and built the company, how we came together, the things that made it into what it is today, as well as the journey of how I started the process of leaving and transitioning out of the company. And I'm gonna be sharing with you really the nitty gritty here, the things that, you know, really we haven't shared with anyone, things that, I'm thinking you'll find very interesting. Looking back before shooting this video, I even, I, I was just mesmerized and really shocked and blown away. All the intricacies and the things along the way that I've learned and the things we've experienced, it's just been such a phenomenal journey. So I'm gonna be sharing that with you. And thank you guys again uh, for your support over the years over on my watch channel, John P. Watches. This channel, I'll be talking more about non watch related content. This video here is going to have a bit of a business and life spin on it. But of course, I have spent the last nearly seven years at Delray Watch, delraywatch.com, building the company, now transitioning out from an initial co-founder and investor to an exit where I'm going to be, you know, working with startups, investing in them and building different businesses with still some connection to the watch industry. So if you're from over on that watch channel, thank you so much for coming over and I hope that you do stick around here because I have some very cool things planned uh, in the future. So Delray Watch, back in 2017, Federico and I came together. We were both in the watch industry and we both kind of became friends over sharing the same interests in watches. I was wearing a Parmigiani Fleurier and at the time, I think when I met him, he was wearing kind of an obscure model of an Eterna World Timer, you know, one of the few Eterna watches that collectors seem to really like outside of, you know, your standard fair blue chip brands, right? It was kind of like a cool, interesting design and we both kind of saw the watches on each other's wrists and, you know, we hit it off and we started talking about uh, the different types of watches that we were in. And at that time, you know, it was still very much like it is today. People want the Rolex, people want the Patek Philippe, people want the AP, and even back then, they really still wanted Panerai, and Hublot was, was pretty hot, though, kind of on its way out. And so we had met, and we hit it off based on that. We liked non-traditional watches, and we both had kind of non-traditional career paths as well. You know, Federico had been working in the watch industry in Richemont, doing a whole number of things as well. I had a technology consulting business when we met. I was uh, providing CTO consulting services to companies in the South Florida area. I'd go into a business and I would find ways that they could really improve the company using technology, people, processes, as well as capital investment. And that's where we came together. But we kind of came together around this. So we had some mutual friends and acquaintances. At the time, watches was very a, like a very close knit community where, you know, people all kind of knew each other. Today, there's so many more people involved. But at the time, people all really knew each other. And so we kind of formed this camaraderie and this friendship. And, you know, moving forward, you know, Federico had his channel at the time and I hadn't quite had you know, much of an online presence. I was, you know, I'm not the most, you know, outgoing person when it comes to putting my life online. And the online community really hadn't grown into what it is today. And so, you know, he had his YouTube channel and I, and as well as the watch uh, industry knowledge, at least in the inner workings of the sales and kind of how the distribution works. And I had this business and technology and, you know, the processes and we put it together one day we were kind of coming up with an idea, you know, what could we actually do? And we just saw that there all of a sudden was really a void in the market for a watch company that was the watch guys or the watch collectors company. You know, you, you saw a lot of bigger companies getting involved or jewelry stores getting into pre-owned, but you didn't really see many standalone by the collector for the collector style companies that were willing to take the chance on these brands like the Parmigiani Fleurier, like the Eterna, like, you know, as something as outlandish as a Cuervo y Sabrinos, these watches that we always kind of like saw a lot of value in, there was just this market, right? We saw a demand for it too, because we saw it on Federico's YouTube channel and we saw just other collectors that we were in connection with. There was this demand. And so, you know, after many hours and kind of working with a lot of dealers, 
talking with other dealers, talking with collectors, we decided to start Delray Watch. And the idea was going to be by collectors for collectors and offering something different. Now, in the early days, the inventory was slim, right? We weren't quite sure how it was going to go. This was a risk we were both taking. We were giving up, you know, our both of our really well-paying careers in a sense to pursue this passion of ours, which was aligned. And that passion was watches, luxury watches that were not your run of the mill. Everyone has them on their wrist, more bang for buck value watches. That's That was our focus. That was our goal. And the goal was to keep a low overhead and keep doing that thing because that was a company that we always wanted. And we heard it over and over and over again from collectors. Hey, I wish there was a company that did this. And we agreed. So we did it from the slim inventory. At the initial days, we were working with some very small dealers that had no online presence. And so I recommend people out there in the world, maybe not in the watch industry any longer because things have certainly changed. But when you start a business and it's the early days, it really pays to be scrappy. You got to make it happen. You got to figure things out, right? At the time, neither he nor I had started a watch company. This was the first time and the work hadn't really been done out there. There hadn't been a proven model. We had to figure it out. People weren't selling on YouTube. This is something we had to pioneer. We had to figure this out. And so we worked with some small dealers and we brought in some of their inventory and we gave that inventory exposure. And sure enough, over time, we started showing the watches, talking about the watches, and people seemed to really enjoy it. Things picked up. People were buying the watches. They were selling the watches to us in the earliest days. I mean, and I'm almost ashamed to admit it, but this is something you learn through trial and error. It's certainly not what goes on today, but we even took a couple of cashier checks in the mail because we wanted to succeed. And we're like, hey, this is how we're going to grow a business. We have to do what we have to do. We also, at least myself, I put up the bulk of my collection, right? The watch collection that I had amassed over a course of seven eight years, I put up right on the site. I was willing to take that risk and let go of my possessions because I really believed in the mission of the company. And I knew we could do it. I saw the traction and I put up my, my inventory. My entire inventory was uh, that I had in my personal collection was put up on the site in the earliest days. And in fact, I actually have right here, I have a watch that was one of the earliest watches. I wore this Zenith El Primero hand wine in the earliest days of Delray Watch. And I put this up for sale. And just recently, I bought this back from Delray Watch. The, the customer actually had traded this watch in, I believe. And I bought the watch and it was even sized perfectly for my wrist. And it was just kind of a, you know, a full circle thing, really, where it's like, hey, this is where, this is where I started get this back in the collection. And I th just think that's awesome. And for me, it just kind of shows that, you know, if you're willing to take a gamble in a risk on certain things that you believe in and you see the data and you see the evidence and the traction's there and there's a good market fit for the product, you got to double down. You got to triple down. You have to keep pushing. This is something that, sure, Federico and I, we both had the gut feeling that this would work and people told us. But the data was also there to support it. We saw the web traffic. We analyzed it. Google Analytics in the earliest days, Salesforce, fully built out, customized everything. And luckily, I had that experience because these were some of the tools that we were implementing. Sure, most companies have something like that today. Seven years ago, though, these things were kind of just hitting the market. It was a lot newer and fresher. We've developed other things over the years. But that's where we started going, right? So we, we found the traction and we kept pushing, moving, and moving onward and upward. Now, growth was something we had to consider, right? As we kept doing more deals, we realized, you know, to scale this, we really need more inventory. We, were, we tried to, sh you know, kind of shy away from consignment. Occasionally, we would work with, you know, a small batch of watches where a dealer would give us watches. Maybe they were kind of an older person, an older jewelry store. Maybe they were going out of business. And there were a couple of wholesalers at the time where they were doing this very commonplace. We knew them very well, uh, but we would reinvest, right? We knew that we had to own all the inventory. We knew that we had to have control. We need to have the ability to generate media, take pictures, content, you name it. And so 
we reinvested most of the money over and over and over again. We tried not to take much out to pay ourselves, even though living in Miami, you kind of get that flashy lifestyle and, you know, maybe a bit of, uh, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. Certainly when I was a little bit younger, started Delray Watch at the age of, you know, I'm not going to give it away, but, you know, mid 20s and now I'm 33. But I guess I'm, I gave it away, right? But nonetheless, we had to reinvest. We started reinvesting, reinvesting, reinvesting. And the watch inventory that we own just grew and grew and grew. And then, you know, of course, we both had other sources of income. So we just started reinvesting more into the company. The inventory grew. The customers grew. We, every single deal we treated as our last because, and this is something Federico really stressed, and I agreed with him, but he was in the watch industry, even starting working in retail. And he truly believed, and I agree with him. And to this day, you know, Delroy Watch is a testament to that. Every single watch deal needs to be treated as your last. This is a handshake industry, a trust industry. You can't be running around out there not caring. You have one bad deal. Oh, okay, maybe there was a mistake. Two bad deals, you're done. You're done. You cannot have bad deals. You need to over deliver. This is a trust industry. You're shipping thousands of dollars in the mail. People are shipping thousands of dollars to you, if not more. This is a trust industry. And the only way to, to have a good reputation is based on treating every last deal as potentially your last. So we kept doing that, reinvesting. We brought in a watch service department, of course. We, we, we met Hans. We knew Hans. Awesome guy, funny, hilarious. We had a blast with him. I remember when we went to Hans and we told Hans our idea, he wasn't totally sold on us. Hans, if you're watching, I know you'll agree, but he wasn't totally sold that we were going to do this. He, he just didn't get it, right? And I, it's understandable. Kind of the old world mentality in the watch industry is things need to be done a certain way. And it's done kind of the jewelry store way. People want to try on the watch. There was kind of the industry was changing as well to where it was going online. And there was a lot of unserved people that maybe don't live buy a boutique. Maybe they live in a non-major city where it's a big hassle for them to go try on watches. I don't think people really realize that enough. But we brought Hans Strudel. You know, he's uh, he's Austrian. And I don't know, it was kind of like a silly idea I came up with. I'm like, you know, we really need Hans. We need to have him on our team. We need to have a really great watchmaker, Swiss classically trained with all this experience you know, running the service departments at Zenith and Breitling and everywhere else he was. So we're like, you know, this guy is basically retired. Let's get him on board. He's awesome. So we show up at his house with Strudel. And, you know, I'm not sure if he thought it was a joke or if he thought it was like, I'm not exactly sure what he thought it was, but it was just hilarious. And, you know, we hit it off with him. You can go back and check out the old videos out there on the internet where we talk with him uh, and just have a good laugh. But, you know, we bring Hans on board and he allowed us to take it to even the next level, right? To start offering the warranties. We'd have gone on to, to build, you know, a bigger service outlay or footprint ultimately. Uh, but, you know, he allowed us to really start adding in these components, right? We started very small, tested the market, validated it, started bringing in the other crucial and critical components. And then we started bringing in an assistant and then an assistant salesperson. And then photographer, right? In the earliest days, the very earliest days, Federico and I were, were doing everything, right? Before we had an office space, before we had everything, we were really bootstrapping it. Of course, we ramped up pretty quickly in a matter of a few weeks. And I thank you know, all of you out there that have been with us through the years, supporting us and helping us and motivating us, keeping us kind of prodding along. And you know, a lot of the, the older guys out there who maybe had gone through something similar and even those that are not just kind of appreciated what we do and we appreciated them. I remember picking up the phone and just talking with people just about things. They just wanted to call in and talk. And, you know, I wanted to know everything the customer wanted. I wanted to know everything the customer wanted us to deliver, to provide. And I would pick up the phone and talk to people at any time about anything. I had people calling in, talking about economics and, you know, Adam Smith and the invisible hand and all this kind of a thing. It was just awesome. So we started putting in all of these different pieces. And as time went on, we just kept doing more of the same. 
when all the other companies were trying to keep up with each other and they wanted to, you know, invest into all of this fluff and all of this kind of trendy stuff, this excitement or no, now we're going to do this. Oh no, now this is the hot brand. Oh, now this is the hot style of content. Oh no, now this is the hot style of X, Y, Z. We didn't. We kept doing the same thing, subtle improvements, iterative improvements, very much in line with, you know, some of the more Japanese ideologies of business growth and management. That was our focus, subtle changes. Let's not risk it. We have something good here. Neither of us really wanted uh, to go back to the things we were doing. This turned out to be so much more fun and enjoyable and honestly profitable for the both, both of us. Previously, I was working with startups and companies, but within a matter of months, this had just really truly taken over 70 to 80 hours of my week. I was not even sleeping very much. And it was so exciting. I was younger. I had the energy, the enthusiasm. We had a blast just kind of keep doing that thing. And of course, we improved over time. And, you know, mind you, while I was growing this business with Federico in the early days, I was actually in grad school at Brown. And it was kind of interesting for me because I was studying entrepreneurship but also it had an engineering focus on the degree program that I was in. It was in the engineering department. And there was a lot of focus on the engineering and the technical aspects, a lot of which I had been studying uh, in my undergrad, studying computer science, but also to see kind of these more, you know, not necessarily bootstrap style, hustle style entrepreneurship methods and be able to kind of, as the business grew, be able to kind of dabble in some of these concepts. And it really proved to work very well. Also, through the years, we had been approached as the watch market exploded. We had been approached four or five times by different companies that wanted to acquire us, or at least in some capacity, big names. And, you know, we talked with them, we would talk with the executives, and, you know, maybe, maybe we just didn't see eye to eye, it just didn't really work. And we had so much of a passion about Delray Watch, it didn't make a lot of sense for us. We love what we were doing. And kind of that exchange of, you know, a big reward or a big payout immediately, but losing the thing we had built, really the, the business we always wish that existed, but also the careers that we always wanted to have. At least I can speak for myself, but, you know, that seemed to be where we were at is this is something that I always wanted to do. I always wanted to work and be in the watch industry. It's kind of funny when I was in undergrad uh, there, I was in a computer science course and it was one of the more senior level courses. And I had, you know, a, a really great professor. He was pretty smart. His name was Ken. I think it might have been a, I'm forgetting it, some type of algorithms course. And I would finish my work much earlier because I, I was a computer geek very early on. You know, we're talking middle school. I was tinkering around with coding and then through high school building things. I mean, I had a full server rack in my parents' bedroom and I was mining crypto in the earliest uh, years before, you know, we, we have it today, we're talking 2009 uh, era, right? So I had this big server rack, um, you know, full size rack with all the different things. I mean, it, it was it was a fun time, but that's where it took me. So I'd have all this spare time, right, in my classes. And I remember I would just be looking on the different websites. I'd be looking at different watches, watch deals would come up and I would see a watch deal come up and and I would snipe it, right? I would say, oh, this is amazing. I'd buy it and maybe I'd wear it for a little bit, but then I would post it on eBay and, you know, try to try to generate a bit of a profit. And that's how kind of how I funded my my hobby at the earliest years of my collecting journey. But anyway, this professor, Ken, he had told me, and I remember this to this day, he says, you know, you're really not going to make a career out of all of this watch stuff that you're doing. And I remember my retort was, you know, I don't want a career. I want to make jobs. I want to create jobs. That's what I want to do. I want to create jobs for others and I want to build a business or businesses. And I remember he would have a bit of a joke or a laugh about that. I'm not sure if he thought I would, I would do it or make it. But, you know, looking back now, all these years later, over 10 years ago now at this point, I don't even know how many years, but looking back, it's kind of funny. It's kind of ironic. And I do believe, I think that something about those interactions in those early years where I really developed that passion, that obsession, almost addiction to the watch market and industry and looking at the prices and finding the deals. And I think that really formed 
subconsciously something inside of me that maybe pushed me into getting myself in the right place at the right time without me really realizing it, right? You look back on something and it all kind of makes sense retrospectively, right? You look back and you think, wow, that's why this could have happened. That's why kind of these things aligned. And that's, you kind of follow that series of events to where you are today, you know, now having left, you know, what was one of the best experiences of my life building Delray watch and having that passion of enjoying all the watches and building a watch company. Just you see all the steps along the way and it's just, it's gives me goosebumps. It gives me chills. If you can't see them, just thinking about kind of that trajectory. And as time went on, we grew the operation. We brought in additional people. We moved into a much larger space. We invested in more equipment, more types of specialty equipment, more safes, more vaults, just additional things. Really, we were experiencing the growing pains of a company, but it wasn't painful. It was enjoyable. I had no problem giving up any type of short-term pleasure for the long-term gain. I believed in it and the writing was on the wall. This is going to work. So we reinvested, kept growing, kept adjusting, kept building, bringing on more people, doing more of the same, but more additional, a little bit better over time, right? To some things people can look back, say overnight success. But for us, me looking back, I can see every single thing we did along the way. And I'll have additional videos on this channel where I'll talk more about some of the tools, some of the business concepts that were involved and a little bit even more in depth here. But this is really giving you an overview of my trajectory with the business. So as, as time went on, Delroy Watch had really taken a mind of its own. It really had grown out and a lot of my responsibility had been shifted to other people. A lot of things that I, that I was doing had been shifted to CPAs, to accountants, to specialists that really took us to the next level. Sure, I'd still be involved and I'd jump in, but at a certain point, everyone was just so good. And I think that's something to focus on. I think it's a really great strategy, something I've done the last seven years. Find someone that's even better than you at the thing and put them in the chair. You still know enough to be dangerous, but if you find the people that specialize and are really great at what they do, whether it's finance or the technology or the different companies uh, that we worked with, put people in those places and they'll even fine tune it, refine it, tune it a little bit here, a little change, a little there, a little this, a little that, take you to the next level. And that's what happened with Delray Watch. So as time went on, I had a lot less responsibility, which meant I had a lot more free time to work on things. And I would work on things at Delray Watch. We implemented a bunch of different technology systems and automations, but some of these things we found to be a little bit cumbersome on the team. And I would start spending a little bit more of my time investing in other companies, startups, other businesses. I just found, including in the watch industry, and try to find overlap between companies, partnerships. And a lot of my time towards the last end of the year, year and a half of my time at Delray Watch had been shifting kind of more into those types of strategic type things, whereas everyone else in the company was really growing it, generating media and pushing it forward from the inside. And I was looking for strategic opportunities. And that brings us into a strategic opportunity that came up with uh, you know, a, a group inside the, the luxury watch and jewelry industry then conversations had been going on for just so long. And through these conversations, Delray Watch continued to skyrocket. All of a sudden, you know, we really hit kind of this breaking point where we really started picking up and taking off and we just kind of hit exit velocity, I'd like to call it. And that's kind of ironically what had happened in the discussions with them. This, this partner really just wanted to put in a bunch of capital and just have a tiny piece of it. Uh, for themselves, but they truly believed in it. And they had a lot of inventory that, you know, they wanted to expose to the market. And so that's, you know, where it takes us today. They had made me an offer that gets me into an exit and also allows me to focus on the other things that I was doing originally that I really have a passion for. In addition to being in the watch industry, investing in startups and in investing in other companies, working with companies to help them grow and scale in the same kind of a way that I did with Delray Watch. And so after a lot of going back and forth and really trying to determine if this was right for me, we came to an agreement that was just a win 
for everyone. If you haven't seen the video uh, where we talk about it, link in the description below, Federico's channel, as well as my watch channel where I talk a little bit more about it. But that is kind of where it takes us. And it was a hard decision for me. You know, I'm at a point where I know there is continued growth and scale in the position that Delray Watch is in, Federico is in. They are going to be unbelievably successful in this industry. Just looking at the web traffic, looking at the deals, looking at the capital. I mean, this is going to be a really phenomenal handful of years for the company. But for me, I do want to get back into kind of having that variance, kind of bouncing between companies and exchanging ideas and be a little bit more nimble with all of it and being able to kind of always stay on the cutting edge looking for the next thing and that kind of more fast pace, you know, innovative way about things is something that's very appealing. So it was a very hard decision to kind of say, hey, this is going to be a phenomenal life going forward with this company building this company continually. But I'm also faced with this really awesome opportunity to take a bit of a pivot and ignite some of my other passions. Music. I love the music industry. I've been playing guitar over 20 years. Not only do I play music, make music, I also invest in it, invest in independent artists, as well as technology. I'm a technologist at the end of the day. I've been Truly a nerd when it comes to this stuff from the, the earliest days of computers, at least mainstream earliest days, getting into you know computer science and then engineering, building company with that and software. I mean, I remember to give you a little bit more, I was when I was wow, like 17, 18 years old, maybe even earlier, 16 years old, I was offering computer tech technology consulting services in Cleveland, Ohio. I would walk in at that age, drive my car that I had actually purchased using the funds from, uh, you know, working a, a part-time job somewhere, right? Uh, and I would drive into companies and I'd had that grind where I'd, I'd drive to the company, I'd walk in and, you know, I would try to sell them on my consulting services. Now, I mean, mostly I'd get kicked out or they would say, hey, we're not interested, but I noticed that you can kind of walk into the smaller companies, some of the more companies where you'd find people that maybe saw something in you, right? I didn't quite realize that was the thing at the time. I just said, hey, more doors to knock on, potentially more deals. I don't know. I probably read some book somewhere. Um, but I, you know, kind of hit it off with there was a cigar company, there was a cigar lounge. And, you know, I noticed they just didn't have a website. So I walked in there and, you know, I'm talking with them and it just turned to be kind of, I guess, my proving grounds in a way, you know, these guys were giving me a shot and I can't really thank them enough at that time. You know, Steve and Roman and Mark and, you know, Peter, I remember these guys to this day, awesome guys, nice guys, but they told me at the time, you know, they, they bring me up there for a meeting and they tell me, you know, we're, we're, we're giving you a shot here. You know, we're really considering you a partner. We're taking a chance with you. And I really, I took it seriously, right? Like this, this was my shot. I kind of felt at the time, you know, like, hey, I do good here. I'll, 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 this will be my launching point. And I remember, you know, we built the website. It was awesome for the time we brought in the photographers. And I mean, this was, this was my biggest deal for the time. I know it's, it's kind of small now looking back, but at the time, this, this was just like the biggest opportunity for me. And people wanted to know, you know, they liked the site and kind of word traveled around there. And you had a lot of entrepreneurs and businessmen that were, you know, hanging out at the cigar lounge. And so one thing led to another. And then, you know, this person owned a company and they needed help with something. And then this person had a company and they needed help with something. And so at a young age, I was kind of bouncing around between these companies offering consulting and services. And I just always, you know, I would stay up till two, three in the morning, even though I had school the next day, I would stay up and just work on these, you know, databases. I remember, you know, one of the places it was a, um, it was like a wheel importer exporter company. And I mean, it was truly a, you know, it was, it was truly like a working environment, a warehouse. And they had you know, a lot of machinery there where they'd like refinish these wheels and there'd be dust flying around and dirt everywhere. I mean, it was truly working. I remember, you know, I went in there and I just told myself, hey, like, this is how you do it. This is how you 
This is how you do it. You put in the time, you put in the work, you prove yourself little by little by little. There's no overnight success. Sure, occasionally you get someone that does a dance online and they're a weatherman and they end up being, you know, some hit dancer online. But how many times had they danced? You know, if you're talking, if you know who I'm talking about, kind of that dancing weatherman guy, how many times had they danced previously? It wasn't their first dance, I bet. So it's kind of the way I took it. And I just kept going and going and going. And that had led me kind of into those steps where I moved into the medical industry. And from the medical industry, I did very much the same thing. I was working with a company there and I was building, I was growing. I was doing all this during undergrad, mind you. At a certain point, I was an undergrad and I moved, worked my way up. And I have to thank, you know, Bob or Robert that really also was another guy that gave me a chance. You know, he's something, he saw something in me that, you know, maybe he related to. He saw that I, I was showing up every day. 30 minutes early and staying very late. I moved. I got an apartment across the street from the office. I'd spend all the time there. Every single thing I did, I treated as the last thing that I would do. And that's that's something that carried over into Delray Watch. But thankfully, I had moved my way up in that company and you know helped grow and scale it. And while there, we structured a uh, an acquisition of one of our competitors. And so I kind of had you know, a feel for all these high level concepts that I was introduced to, I think, well, of course, these were really generous, nice people for giving me the exposure and allowing me to move up quickly and give me these opportunities. But also, I played my end of the bargain. I offered things that would help them. And if I, a lot of guessing, right, is this going to work? Is that going to work? If not, move on to the next thing. And so, from there, I just had all this exposure. I grew up and you know, at a certain point, this person that had owned the majority of the company, they wanted to pretty much just spend more time relaxing. They had been into their late or mid to late seventies and you know, they love working as well. They had a similar kind of background as me, but they made me in charge of this company. Now it wasn't a massive company. I think at the largest, maybe it had 15, 20 employees. And then we kind of consolidated as time went went on and the, that kind of medical industry, medical consulting and technologies kind of consolidated. But from there, I just pushed on. I kept doing a lot of the things. And even there, I remember pe people would say, oh, you know, why are you spending money on these watches? And for me, the watches, it wasn't about the luxury symbol or the status kind of a thing. It was just a hobby and a passion. It was almost, you know, it's indescribable, but it was just something that I knew I had this calling for, and it was kind of always an undertone through those earliest times in my career history. And the fact that I could kind of pivot later in life, I after I had moved down to Miami, a, you know, a company, a real estate technology company had brought me down to Miami to be their CTO, and I had served there, and that introduced me to even more concepts and things at a much larger scale. They had many more employees. It was much bigger but it allowed me to kind of have even more interactions, but also at that executive level. And I was at the time, you know, 25. And so I do have to thank, you know, Oliver uh, Seidler as well for really taking, you know, a gamble on me and trusting me and believing me at, as well, because I learned so much from him. And, you know, I, I can't, I really can't thank him enough either to have given me the opportunity at such a, a young age to be kind of exposed to some of these concepts and have access to the different um, entrepreneurial networks, including EO, that I had uh, become you know, a member and really enjoyed uh, being part of as well, to just be exposed to all these entrepreneurs and learn even more that I could add to my journey that would become Delray Watch and the other consulting and businesses that I would do and will do in the future. So that takes us into today, where it's a very sad but exciting moment that I'm leaving Delray Watch as one of the owners and co-founders and original investor. It's very sad, but it's also exciting because I like to do new things. I always like to keep learning. It's a passion of mine. Keep learning, lifelong learning, always improving, continue to focus on building myself, become resilient, because I do believe, even with watches, setting watches aside, I believe that knowledge is the only thing that cannot be taken from you. If you learn something, it can't be taken from you. Okay, maybe you get dementia, but do you know it's been taken from you? You get the idea. So that's where I'm going, getting back into the different business endeavors I've been working on, 
investing in those industries, and also posting here on this channel. So if you're at the end of this video and you found this interesting, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you stick with me through this additional content that I'm going to be posting here, different interviews with pretty cool people, you know, maybe some musicians and some other investments and some startups that I'm working with and have invested in some cool projects in the future, including also in the watch industry. And I'm sure I'll still be around the Delray watch sphere, uh, working with things Federico and the rest of the team on other cool projects in the future. Thanks guys for being with me once again through all the years. I look forward to many more and we'll see you next time.